New Year. God bless you in this wonderful New Year. That wasn't a very good Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Awesome. Happy New Year, um, Facebook crowd, wherever you're at and whenever you join us, but we're glad that you're with us as well. Let's stand for an opening word of prayer, and, uh, and we'll launch into our great hymn of the faith, How Great Thou Art. Yeah, Father, we just thank you that you make all things new. And we just thank you that even, even being here this morning, rejoicing in you, is just wonderful. We just thank you for your presence. Draw near to us, Lord, in every way, through music, through each other, through the message, through every facet of why we're here, gathered together. Bless the Facebook, uh, the online uh, congregation, or as one pastor said, the podgregation. Bless them, Lord, as they tune in and participate with us. So we just thank you for this morning, for this day, the day that you have made. Thank you for this year in advance. And uh, bless our time together this morning. In, in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.
your bulletin is a responsive reading as we, one, begin a new year, and two, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper this morning. Did everybody get a little packet, communion packet? If not, there's some back there. We want to read this, and I just want to pray as we celebrate and receive the elements this morning. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. I forget what lies behind and press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let's pray for a moment. It's a privilege, Lord, to receive these elements. It's a privilege to celebrate all that you have done for us at the cross and by rising again from the dead. Thank you because of your shed blood. You remember our sins no more. Thank you that you remind us who we are in you. Sometimes, Lord, we focus on our failures and our mistakes. Even the yesterdays or the last weeks or the last year. Thank you that not just because this is a new year, but because we are always new in you every day. Whether it's the middle of July or the middle of January, we are always new in you. As we receive these elements, as we remember what it means that you died on the cross for our sins. That we will not focus, that we will forget what lies behind. Whatever failures, whatever sins, we thank you that, that as it were, you have amnesia. You can't remember what it was because we've confessed that. And we're under your blood. We're under the new covenant. Thank you that you see us washed and clean because of Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, as we receive these simple tokens, these symbols, to not let us just do so out of a ritual because it's the first Sunday of the month, but help us to put our hearts and our minds on you. Come, Holy Spirit, and do that for us. Thank you, Lord, that you make all things new. And that includes every one of us. That includes our church. That includes our family. That includes, Lord, our hearts and our minds, that we are new every day. So as we receive these elements, Lord, we do so with honor, with joy, with reverence, with uh, because of you. Thank you. Do something powerful, Lord, even as we <laughs> uh, swallow these elements. Just do something powerful, Lord, even though they're just symbols. Just in this worship moment, we just say, Lord, we love you. We love you. In fact, congregation, would you just join me on that very simple chorus, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. On the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he said, this is my body which is broken for you, eat all of it. And 
then Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Drink all of it. Thank you, Lord. I'd like to just close this time with another word of prayer. Father, we receive these elements and we thank you that we are thus signifying um, healing in the atonement. We thank you that you cleanse us from sin. We thank you that you heal us spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Thank you that, that Matthew records the words of Isaiah when Jesus healed people. Thank you that you heal us, Lord. You heal us. And I pray right now for your healing upon people's lives. That people would walk away from this, this sanctuary today going, something's different in me physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Because of you, Jesus. Thank you. Make your presence known. Make it felt. Make it real in all of our lives. In your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. So... For just a few moments as the choir is dismissed, kids, come on up. Those kids that I do see here this morning, come on up. Awesome. Well, there's a couple coming in from nowhere. And that's a nice new shirt, too. Well, hold on. You went to your grandma's for Christmas, and... and your grandma had that as a present, right? And you know what you want to do? You want to wear this shirt for five days, right? That's what you want to do. Because it's new, you just want to wear it out right now. Do it, man. That's what I used to do. That's what I do today if somebody wouldn't say stop wearing that because I just wear clothes out, right? You want to do that, man. Okay, this is a new year, right? Okay, so we just want to focus on the word new. This, this guy said he already has a new shirt on, and that is a sharp-looking shirt. How many of you have new clothes on? No, you can't show us your underwear. But how many of you have new clothes on? Oh, so what's new? Tell us what's new. That's awesome. Two new shirts. And, and it's, oh, that are at home. Okay. So you raised your hand about something. You're wearing something new. What is it? No. It's at home? It's back there? Okay. Something new is back there. Okay. Oh, it's your new coat. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Cool. All right, so can you see anything new out there? Can you see anything new? You're not sure? That's kind of a tough question. That's kind of a tough question, isn't it? Do you think all of those people are new? Well, yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. Because we're all new every day in Jesus. We're all new. All right, so... I want, to, I want to challenge you to think about something new that you can do. What is something new that you can do? You ever thought about that question? Something new that you can do that you haven't done before. You're kind of staring off into space right now. Like, that's okay. I do that occasionally. What is something new that you can do? My sister played a new game. I hear two things there. One is that you and your sister played a new game, and it might have been new that you played a game with your sister. Right? Okay, just, just teasing you there a little bit. What is something new that you can do? Did you have your hand up? Not sure. Something new. Playing a game with your sister is awesome. I'm going to give you one new thing that you can do. You ready? Do you have something new that you can do? Okay, you ready? Backflip in the water. A backflip in the water. 
that would be something new. And you're, and you're probably good at that. Have you done that yet? Yes, I think. Okay, all right. What's something new that you can do? Playing a game with my family. I didn't quite get that. Playing a game with my family. Playing a game with your family. That is something new that you can do. Okay, so I've got something new that you can do. Are you ready? Now you have to promise me that you're going to do this every night before you go to sleep. Brush your teeth would be a good one. I agree. I agree. But you said something. Something new you can do is pray. But here's what I want you to do. Not just pray for yourself. Who do I want you to pray for every night? No, you're praying to Jesus. Yeah, you're praying to God and Jesus, but but you want to pray for something or someone, and who would that be? Maybe other people. Okay, you're getting warmer. Other people. Let's bring it down to how about every night before you go to sleep, you say a prayer for your family. That's right, your family. And more specifically, here's what I'm after, for your your mom and and your dad. You know why? You know why? Because they're raising you and they really need prayer. That's why. I'm teasing you. Right? They need prayer though. I was a parent. I still am. They're just all the kids are kind of gone. Well, not all of them are gone. But we still we as parents still need lots of prayer cuz we love our kids. They love you. So every night, before you go to sleep, you can pray for your grandma and grandpas and aunts and uncles. But pray for who? Mom, Mom and dad, because they need prayer because they're raising you. All right. So who would like right now to pray for your mom and dad? Want to practice? No? Are you going to promise me you're going to do it every night before you go to sleep? Pray for your mom and dad. You're going to pray? Okay, let's close our eyes. All right, here we go. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for, for my family and, and the family of my friends and the family of the friends of my friends. And thank you for this year that you give us. In your name, amen. Amen. Okay. All right. Good, good. Do you want to grab an instrument and sing with the worship team? Yeah. Okay. That's kind of fun.
just thank you that your name is blessed and is the name above every name. Thank you, Lord, that we can step into the stream of worship that goes on before the throne continually. And by the heritage that we carry in our DNA, my guess is that we would represent most of the nations on earth. Lord, thank you that we are still free to gather and worship your name publicly. While the persecution for doing this is growing in many countries. We lift those believers to you today, Lord, that worship at the cost of their lives. Of going to jail, of losing family, jobs, friends, and possibly their lives. Lord, we don't take it for granted, but we stand in gratefulness for it. Thank you, Jesus, that it is in your name that there is salvation, healing, deliverance, freedom, and favor. So we carry it with gratefulness, Lord, and ask that by your Holy Spirit we would dispense the love and light that you've placed within us. Lanterns, incense burners, dispensers of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Children can go to Sunday school. take them any day. Do you realize that there are churches that don't have the sound of kids banging stuff and, and uh, you realize that? Aren't we blessed to have a little resurgence here of kids and, and uh, great teachers and wow. I'm changing my sermon. Not just now. I changed it during the week. I'm still in this miracle series, and so the title and whatever's in your bulletin isn't going to uh, fit with what I believe God wanted me to reconstruct. Uh, maybe the message is just for me, right? They always are. I just preach to Jesus and me. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tackle a subject that I just felt needed to, I don't know if it's a time out in the miracle series or... It's going to be a timely word in your life or something. I'm going to just tackle something. I don't know what struck me, but late Friday and Friday night, I just sat down and I wrote out some things. And so I'm going to deal with, um, pardon the pun, I'm going to deal with a subject called dealing with uncertainty. I don't know. Maybe it's because it's a brand new year. And sometimes in a brand new year, people have uncertainty about the days ahead. I, I don't know if that triggers people or not. It doesn't really me, uh, uh, but yet I can struggle with uncertainty uh, in my life. So I'm going to tackle that this morning. And maybe it's part of the miracle series. I don't know, maybe it's a miracle that we deal with it. And, and we come to place of resolve and peace and assurance. Um, I'd like you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. I'm really going to preach off of, of two verses, but I'm going to read that entire passage about worry and uncertainty. While you're turning there, um, I'm going to read a passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, which it would take you till 1230 to find 2 Chronicles. I get that. It took, takes me forever to find some of those Old Testament passages. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, King Jehoshaphat uh, who was king of Judah at the time, was informed that armies were going to invade uh, Jerusalem and Judah. He's a godly man, but he didn't know what to do. He just didn't know what to do. And I love verse 12 in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, where he says, O our God, will thou not execute judgment upon them? For we are powerless against this great multitude that is coming up against us. And then I love this phrase, out of his own heart, out of his own faith, 
We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Well, God sent some solutions and through a prophet and through what he was supposed to do. And we know the end of the story, but at the moment, Jehoshaphat doesn't know that. But he's given this great word that I want all of us to hear today. Fear not, this is in verse 17, fear not and be not dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them and the Lord will be with you. What a great word, what a great word. Now I want to turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. In this great passage uh, uh, against anxiety and worry, I thought it'd be appropriate to read this whole text here. It's not long, it's not long at all. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor about your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add one cubit to its span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O people of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? Could we insert there? What sh where shall we go? What decisions do I make? Um, all of that. For the Gentiles seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be yours as well. And therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, literally about tomorrow for tomorrow will be anxious for itself let the day's own challenges be sufficient for the day and then i want to remind us of this great verse in the book of revelation revelation 1 8 i am jesus said the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end says the lord god who is and who was and who is to come the Almighty. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Well, how do I get into a message about uncertainty? Well, it's an old metaphor, but I want to kind of go there today to give you kind of the, what I sense that we feel when we think about the word uncertainty. You have seen this picture before. It's a picture of the lift that Dennis and I, I don't know what happened. Is this on? Okay, something happened in my ears or something. Is it on? Yeah. All right, good, good. Something happened up here. I don't know. Picture of this lift that Dennis and I rented to get that top cone and the cross of the Crow Agency Church. Now, that was a unique out-of-the-box experience for me because to do some of the lower levels of that building and just to get used to that lift lifting you up, was kind of scary just to go up 15 or 20 feet, not used to that. But we knew someday we're gonna have to go 45 and 50 feet up in that lift to get the top cone and the cross. <laughs> and, and so the guy at, at the rental service said, it's not gonna tip over on you. And it's really cool to watch that, the one that we rented, it's got these four legs on it, they fold down, looks like a, a moon land rover or something. The, the pods fold down and they're so secure, right? But when you're 20 feet up, everything feels secure. You get used to that. But we knew one day we were gonna have to really elevate this thing and lift it up and, and get that top stuff. Now, the more that you extend up, the more that you extend up and the more that you extend out, the weaker you feel. Now, here's the metaphor. I have all the trust in the machine. You're stable. But the more that you go up, 
and the more that you extend out. I'm not used to high wire stuff. I don't like heights. That's why we live on the West End. Um, I, don't, I don't like to go up on ladders. I, I, I just, you know, and so obviously some of you, maybe you've been in occupations where, where you know, you worked on 50, 60 feet up on wires or something. You're used to that with lifts, but I wasn't. And so you go up and you go out and that thing feels really flimsy. It's not as secure as it is at 20 feet. It just feels flimsy and you bounce and you bounce. Any movement in that cage and the two of us, it bounces and you look down and then thoughts invade your head like, will a pin, will a pin come out of the connecting pieces? And on the day, the first day that we went up to get the cross and the cone, we had to put some primer on it or scrape it or whatever we did. I'm not sure what we did because we went up twice. And the first day, of course, it was a learning curve. We're going up and that thing is really flimsy and you're looking down and the machine looks great. It's very stable. So you trust in it. It's very stable. But the higher you go and the further you go out, man, it's flimsy. It was so just that, just the, me just the mechanics of every little thing you feel. It was windy, secondly, that didn't help. And thirdly, Dennis is singing, nearer my God to thee. <laughs> I didn't appreciate that. Now he really, he's not here today, and maybe he's watching online, but he really wasn't singing. I gave him a bad time though. I said, stop singing, nearer my God to thee. Do you know something that I don't know? I mean, should I have? done the will before we did this or whatever. I mean, are we going to crash? I mean, you, all those thoughts invade because now you're 45 and 50 feet up. And, you're, and, and, and it's, it's this interesting metaphor. You trust in the machine. It's stable. It's not going to tip on you. That's what the rental guy said. It's not going to tip on you. People have gone higher than that. But then you're extended out. And you're going, oh my word. And you're looking down at the freeway. And you're looking down at the, oh. And you just feel this uncertainty. That's the metaphor I want to give you. I think in life, that's what we feel. We trust in God. We trust in the word. We trust in our past experiences, sometimes. We find ourselves in new avenues, maybe a new year, and I'll talk about uncertainty in just a moment, but it's this metaphor we're kind of caught in between. If you can identify with that, great. If you're here today and you can't identify with it and you like, what are you doing, Pastor? Are you saying we, we, we sh should live in uncertainty? No. I'm going to unpack what it means to me anyway to deal with uncertainty. Point number one, uncertainty is not entirely a lack of faith. It can be, and it can lead to that. But at the outset, uncertainty in a lot of things is not entirely a lack of faith. At least in my opinion, I don't believe it is. Let me give you some scriptural examples. One that I just read, great godly man Jehoshaphat has this multitude coming upon him and he says, we don't know what to do. Now, yes, he received a prophetic word and he was told what to do, but at that moment, he's uncertain. We don't know what to do. Our eyes are upon you. To me, that's faith. But he didn't know what to do. He was uncertain. I think of the Christmas story, Mary. When she was confronted, invited, however you want to phrase it, with the angel Gabriel, how can this be? I'm uncertain. I've never <laughs> been the recipient of the Holy Spirit uh, in my life, and I'm going to bear a child. How can this be? And for several moments, perhaps, we don't know how long it took for her to come to a place of certainty. I think of Zechariah in the same way as I preached on Zechariah. And then, of course... It's the great scriptural example of Thomas after the resurrection. Thomas, I will not believe. I'm uncertain. I have doubts. I have uncertainty. For me, the ice is rather thin here, Thomas said, until I see the marks in his side and his hands. 
And he was invited. Jesus said, come on. And it became a my Lord and my God moment. So in my opinion, uncertainty is not entirely a lack of faith. Although many sincere Jesus-honoring Christians believe it is. I don't. I think we're all in process in many things. And here's why I say this, because number one, oh, well, we'll go to the scriptures. Um, number one, I, I want to underscore this point, and I'm glad I put this on the slide. I want to make sure that I'm communicating and you're not hearing that I am saying that doubt or skepticism or always questioning makes you smarter. I am not saying that. I am not championing doubt. I am not lifting up doubt or uncertainty as the gold standard. I just think it's real, and we're human, and we see things and we feel things that kind of make us uncertain, kind of like when, when we kind of get in a lift and we wonder what's going on. So I'm not saying that doubt or uncertainty suddenly makes you smart or smarter than the average Christian. Here's what I am saying and why I'm saying uncertainty as bullet point number one um, is not a lack of faith. I believe, number one, we all have practical issues. We all have practical issues of our life that we are uncertain about. They may be decisions that are forthcoming in your life. They may be things in your life. Let me just kind of enumerate some things. You may have uncertainty about some people in your life and their motives. Where are they coming from? I don't know if I trust them. You may have uncertainty about certain people in your life. Okay, you, want, you don't want to slide into judgmentalism, but that's, that's, that could happen. That could happen. Happens in congregations all the time. We don't know where our pastor is coming from. So it takes years to kind of build trust. You may have practical questions about the Bible. You may have been hearing some of this series about miracles. And, and in the back of your mind, though you'd never say it in church, you're going to, I don't know if that happened. I don't know if the chicken tenders did show up in that refrigerator in Texas. I'll bet you that author's just making it up. You can have practical questions like that. And that causes you to feel uncertain. You may have circumstances in your life. Why is God doing that? Why is that door closed? Why, why isn't that happening in my life? You can have all kinds of things that kind of create uncertainty in your life. I don't think that's a lack of faith. I think you're just kind of mulling things around and trying to process things in your life. Now, get it. I, I get it. I am not questioning my salvation, nor do I want you to. I'm not questioning the truth of the word of God. I'm just saying there are many practical issues in life that you may feel, for me, the ice is kind of thin, and, and I don't know if I can trust right now. Okay, I'm going to unpack that on another point. Here's the second reason that I want to kind of start with this is because uncertainties in our lives can be tremendous growth areas if you allow them to be. They can be miracles in your life. They, sometimes behind that uncertainty is joy. I think with Thomas, his uncertainty, his doubt became a, a my Lord, my God moment in his life. So I think Jesus certainly invites every one of us just to bring our uncertainties to him every day. And I'll talk about seeking the Lord in a moment. Um, but uncertainty is not a lack of your faith. I want to be crystal clear about that, even if you don't agree with that. I want to be crystal clear. That's my heart. That's my pastor's heart. That uncertainty is not a lack of faith. Let me give you a simple illustration that works for me. And maybe some of you have had this experience this month or this week. I think historically we probably all have had this experience. And it would be this. You've had something you don't feel well. You've had something wrong physically with you. You just sense it. So you go to the doctor. And you're sitting in the doctor's waiting room, right? Anybody been there? I don't know if you've been there lately, but I think all of us have been there. Maybe you've had tests run. You've had 
uh, MRIs run, you've had blood work done, and you're sitting there in the waiting room. I think everybody in a doctor's waiting room is in a transition moment because they don't know the information that that doctor's going to give them, whether, whether they're going to come out of that building with, one, a peace of mind, a next step, or maybe not such good news. But everybody in a doctor's waiting room is in a transition moment because they lack information and sort of they lack this confirmation of what's going on in my body. That's life. I'm going to suggest to you that's life. And I wouldn't say that people in a doctor's waiting room are lacking faith. I wouldn't say that Jehoshaphat, uh, when he said, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. That's not lack of faith. I think any time you turn to Jesus, any time in prayer, any time you just turn to the word and you go, I don't know the answer to this. I don't know why I'm struggling with this, but my eyes are on you and help me in my unbelief. Dear friends, I think that's faith. So any uncertainty, any uncertainty isn't entirely a lack of faith. It can lead you there, and I don't want that. I don't think you want that either. It can lead you there if you don't address it and make choices to kind of resolve some things. But just to say you're uncertain about practical issues of life and things that you may have to face and I may have to face in the coming year or tomorrow is certainly not a lack of faith. But that's not the only thing I want to say. Number two, and, and this is going to sound like a cliche, but this is how I deal with uncertainty in my life, or at least how I try to process it, and it's this. It's based on Matthew 6, 33, where Jesus said, against the anxieties, the worries, the uncertainties of life, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be yours as well. I'm going to comment on all these things. But I want to suggest as a positive choice that you just don't drown in your uncertainty, whatever that might be, or go around saying, well, I'm uncertain, I'm uncertain. I get it. We all have uncertainties in our life. But we need to make positive choices and say, okay, what am I going to do about it? And even though that sounds like a cliche on the screen, keep seeking the Lord, folks, I'm going to unpack this moment in a way that I don't, it's kind of new and fresh to me. Keep seeking the Lord. Jesus said against the uncertainties of life, whatever they may be, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, which means, and I think you know it means, it's more than just going to the church or reading your Bible once a day. It means sort of emptying and pressing in to the things of God and all these things shall be yours as well. Could it be that all these things is peace, perspective, and assurance against the uncertainties of life? So what does it mean to seek the Lord? It, that be, can be a cliche. I get that. What does it mean to you to seek the Lord? What does it mean to me to seek the Lord? I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to suggest it means for me, it means in prayer, in prayer, in the word, in research. I do a lot of research on topics. In research, in wise counsel with other believers, trusted friends, some of you. I want to dig in to why I'm uncertain about something. I want to explore that in prayer. I want to be like that man in Mark 9, help me in my unbelief. Why, why do I not, why am I uncertain, Lord? I want to explore that in prayer. I, I want to take you a little deeper here this morning about getting behind the cliche of what does it mean to seek the Lord? What does it mean to you in the uncertainties of your life to go a little deeper about how do I need to press in in the word? How do I need to pray through? Why do I feel uncertain? And then for the purpose of this on the screen, for peace, don't we all want peace? You wonder why you feel uncertain or there's an angst in you? Don't you want peace? 
don't you want a perspective how to look at something different? And assurance, assurance, <laughs> assurance that I am on the right path, that this is a good decision, or um, this person is really valid and I can trust them. I want assurance of that, all right. Now, so far so good, right? So far, so good. Just keep seeking the Lord. The question is, why is seeking the Lord so doggone important? Why doesn't he just give us his miracle stuff just right now? Okay, I'm going to give you a couple of reasons why I think seeking the Lord is so, so important. And it's more than just going to church, even though that's good. I'm glad you're here today. Um, it's more than just... Your, even just your simple devotional time, which is very, very important. I would say number one is we too easily give up. We too easily give up. When we're challenged by something, there's a proverb, and I should have done the research, it just occurred to me, there's a proverb, I think it's Proverbs 19, that says when you give up in the day of, a, of adversity, your strength is too small. We give up too easily when we're challenged by things, we're challenged by a person, we're challenged by something, we just give up. And we even cop out and say, well, it must be God's will. We just give up. We give up seeking the Lord that maybe he's got a different perspective for us. We just give up too easily. Now, the illustration I want to give you is not so much about seeking the Lord, but it's about not giving up. Last Sunday afternoon, as I uh, went to Parkview and did this service, the Lord led me, and Colleen and Rodney were there, the, the Lord led me to... Just do a simple devotional thought. It's what I do there. We sing a lot. Just do a simple devotional thought about that marathon runner that didn't give up. I'm not saying Rodney or Colleen felt this, but there was something, because we're pretty close in proximity when I'm there. And something happened between my eyes and their eyes. I want to use the word magic but I don't like that word, so I won't use the word magic. There's something that happened. I think it was the anointing of God. Because some people there aren't there, but they're there. You understand what I just said? And some are really there. They really are. They just really enjoy the service. And when I talked about not giving up, and I used that verse in Hebrews 12, and I said... We're all in a race. Your race isn't over. Something happened in their eye. I think they needed to hear, and I think I needed to hear, my race isn't over. Your race isn't over here today at First Baptist, and their race at Parkview is not over until the Lord says it's over. And there's something about not giving up. And then I asked them, we're, we're a small group, and I asked them, what do we give up on? You would be amazed the answers they gave me. We give up on ourselves. We give up on our health. We give up on one another. Well, that's a good word right there. It was a powerful moment. There was something about not giving up that needed to be said. Maybe it needs to be said today, too, which I'm saying it. Because there's something in our spirit that we want to give up on things. We want to give up on our faith, or we want to give up on pursuing to a different level of why. Um, I'm bothered or I have uncertainty. Do you give up too easily? Pressing in to getting an answer from God. I think we all do, and I'm just challenging you to think a little deeper. Now, I'm going to take you a little bit deeper about why it's important to seek the Lord. This is one step deeper, and I hope I don't lose you in the well. But this is the second reason. And I stumbled onto this reason, and then I read an essay that I'm going to just give you a snippet of here today. I believe one of the reasons we have to seek the Lord is we have to push through negative experiences. Negative experiences will cause you to doubt. Negative experiences anywhere in life will, cause, will create uncertainty. If I took my car, and by the way, I have great experience going to tire shops here in Billings, but if I took my car 
and I went to a tire shop and I had two negative, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt for one, but if I had two negative experiences with them, I'm not going back because it's created uncertainty in my life. And so will you. You have a negative experience in a restaurant, uh, you probably won't go back there, whatever the negative experience is, because it creates doubt, it creates uncertainty. I believe you have to seek the Lord to push through to a new place of healing, a new place of resolve past your negative experience. Are you with me? Because the illustration I'm going to give you is, it's an essay which I won't read. I'll give you a 30-second synopsis, and I'll share why I'm sharing it. It was a fantastic essay. I'm glad I read it. It wasn't one of those heartwarming essays that I read online, but I saved it. And I'm going to share with you a 30-second written by a, a lady who I think was, is in her 50s or 60s. Here we go. She was raised in what she calls a cult. It's a beautiful essay that she wrote. She wasn't bashing anybody. She was processing what she was raised in. She called it a commune. She called it a cult. And she named the things that she believed in, that the cult believed in and practiced. I'm reading the essay and I'm going, I believe in those things. I believe in those things that she practiced and that her group, her commune, got into. It, was, it wasn't a cult theologically. It was a cult socially. It was controlled by one leader who demanded they share all their property with one another, and they live in a commune. How icky. Sounds like the Hutterites, doesn't it? <laughs> You're not laughing. But that's how Hutterites live. They live in a colony. They, they kind of practice communalism. Amish don't, but the Hutterites do. But this wasn't a Hutterite group. This was a group that believed kind of the Bible. And she started naming things in this essay. They went, oh, I believe in that. I believe That's in the Bible. I believe in that. And she believed that because of her experience now, now here's, here's the point, she raises at the end of the essay, is there any safe church out there? Are you with me? She's processing her uncertainty because she had such a negative experience growing up in this commune she doesn't know if anything in the Bible now is true. I know that's not your life story, probably. I know that. Why am I even sharing that? Because whatever negative experiences we have, they will create doubt and uncertainty. And you've got to push through those things. I have to push through things to understand a new place, a new perspective, and peace and assurance. That's why the seeking the Lord is not just a cliche. It is the DNA. It is the DNA of our Christian pilgrimage. So I don't, I don't criticize this author who wrote the essay. She was actually very kind and graceful and didn't bash and didn't report like physical or sexual abuse. She just... She just questions now. I don't know if I believe anything because of what the negative experiences she grew up in. Hello, you may have kids or grandkids that do the same thing. It's not your fault. It's just, it's just one of those life things. You gotta push through negative experiences. Well, that's not the only thing I wanna say here today. On a lighter note, I, I want to go into a third thing of dealing with uncertainty. But does this make sense? You've got to continually seek the Lord and push through to new areas. 
uh, of your life to deal with uncertainty. Number three, when I think of uncertainty, I want to make sure of this, that I don't, and, and I certainly don't want you to, to borrow from the future. Jesus, against the uncertainties of life, said in Matthew 6, 34, um, therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, literally tomorrow, not just next year, but literally tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Let today, let Sunday, it's today January 2nd, let Sunday, January 2nd, I get lost in the sermon, I can't remember what day it is. Is, sun, is it to Sunday or what? <laughs> let today's own trouble be sufficient for the day. I don't think Jesus was lifting up just living hand to mouth. I know sometimes in the crisis center ministry, we encounter people, but I don't want to put everybody in the same boat here. There are people who have goals and vision that are struggling on the street, but they do have goals and vision for what they want to do. There are other people who just thrive on living hand to mouth. I get that. That's not what I believe Jesus is saying here. But he is saying, he is saying, there's something about us humans that we project into the future, whether it's next week, next month, this year, whatever, and we borrow from the future. We borrow from it, and that affects us today. Now, I'm going to unpack this in two ways. Um, here's how we borrow from the future. Number one, and why it's not good, why borrowing from the future or thinking down the road too much, too far, isn't really good for any of us. Number one would be, we make negative assumptions that never happen. Hello. The old adage, 99% of what you stress about, what you worry about will never happen. What you dread will never happen. That's for, true. I think we all have life experiences where I really worried about that and it never materialized. I don't know if that's a sin nature thing or the devil plays on our minds or what, but, but many, the negative assumptions that we make uh, never happen in life. But we get trapped in that almost on a daily basis. So if that's a good word for any of us, then we just need to realize I'm going to take today and live one day at a time and live in faith. doesn't mean I don't have vision and I don't have goals and I don't have those things, but the things that stress me out will probably never happen. Now, on the positive side, here's why it's not good to borrow from the future. We assume this will happen, and then we get disappointed. I don't know how many of you have a clever imagination, and you like to dream, and you have hopes, and you have dreams. That's good. But I think what happens is we just assume, yeah, this will happen, this will fall in place, and, and, and this will be my nice whatever. And that never happens. And you're going, God, why didn't you make that happen? Well, we don't want to do that either. Now, I know this is an extreme example, but I get a kick out of it. You can go online and research this. Uh, um, I get a kick out of this every time I share it because while it's extreme, it makes a great kind of humorous point. In France, according to this illustration, they have a real estate deal. We're not used to this in our country, but perhaps in other countries, but especially in France, they do this where a low-income senior is living in an apartment, a younger person can pay rent on that apartment, and it's their down payment to own that apartment. And it helps the low-income seniors who can't live in that place to, they can live in a place until they die, and, and it becomes this, this person who's been paying for it at a much younger age becomes their apartment. It's kind of putting, buying a house before you live there. So this man, I won't try to pronounce his name, he was 47 years old, and he developed a contract with this lady who was in her 90s. And he would pay her to live there, and then when she passed away, it would be his. Simple deal. It was a good deal for both of them. The only problem is she was in her 90s, and she became the oldest living woman she didn't die till she was 120. <laughs> it's a true story. When he started this contractual arrangement, he was 47. He died. He died at age 77. He paid, according to this article, 
184000 for an apartment he never lived in. Isn't that something? Because he assumed, well, she's in her 90s. You know, she'll be gone here in another year. Oh, my word. I know that's an extreme example. But do you do that? We never want to do that. We say, Lord, what is your will? It's great to have hopes, dreams, and plans. I get that. But, Lord, what is your will? I, I think this borrowing from the future is so helpful to live daily and to say, I want to enjoy today. I'm going to throw a couple of things before I, I just end this message here. How to let the day be the day. How to let the day be the day. I haven't thought about that. How do you do that? I think, number one, I think you have to practice putting the overwhelming stuff at the Lord's feet every day. Because I think, I, I know we're all different ages, we have different task responsibilities. Some of you are retired, and I don't know. I, I don't know if you're bored, or, or I don't know. Some of you have tremendous responsibilities. Okay. So I don't know this overwhelming, do you get overwhelmed? I don't know. I can get overwhelmed. You have to put the overwhelming stuff at his feet every day. Every day. And say, I can't go there next week. I just got to let today be today. And I think secondly, and this is what works for me. I want to be grateful for daily challenges. I, I want to be grateful for the stuff I've got to do today that's a challenge, whether it's, whether it's laundry, whether it's a sermon, whether it's, I don't put those two on the same equivalent, by the way, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, want to be, I want to be grateful for daily challenges that take my eye off of what ifs and what's going to happen in the summertime. What's going to happen if this happens? I'm just grateful for daily challenges. I would say that's a byproduct of refing. There have been more times I've stepped on a court, I'm troubled about something, and at the end of the game, it's, it's more like, how do I get through this game? And I've forgotten about what I was troubled about. I think that's the Lord's therapy in my life anyway. Um, so be grateful for the daily challenges. One more point that I want to end on here today. So I've talked about uncertainty. It's not a lack of faith. always forget what I preached on. I hope you don't forget. <laughs> don't borrow from the future. Don't borrow from the future. And then I talked and I wanted to unpack what does it mean to seek the Lord. Now I want to finish. When I think of uncertainty in my life, I think of uncertainty in all of our lives and dealing with that. I want to end on this. I want to end on Revelation 1.8. There is a place, and I hope it's a daily place, for all of us that we realize he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end of our days. It's Revelation 1.8. I'm going to give you a couple of statements of what I call theology and then I want to wrap it up. He was before us. Amen. He knitted you together in your mother's womb. He is with us. And what I like at the beginning of a new year, he is way ahead of us. I think we need to realize that. He is not one step ahead of you. He's at your finish line. But he's with us. Another statement of theology would be this. He knows our days, our outcomes, our decisions, and has us covered. Could you ever get out of God's will? Yeah. But he is so good and so loving that he'll make it look like it was his will in the first place to get you back on where you needed to be. That's where I go with my theology of providence. I have a free will. And so do you. So I kind of lean toward more being an open theist than a Calvinist, that God can maneuver around my free will and get me what he wants me to do and how he wants me to do it, and it makes it look like that was his plan in the first place. I'm, I'm influenced by Greg Boyd from, from uh, Minnesota on that point. 
He knows our days, our outcomes, our decisions, and has us covered. He has us covered. You just can't outmaneuver the Alpha and the Omega. You just can't. Amen? I mean, and so every day, every day, it's got to be this resting in that, worshiping him. You are my Alpha and Omega in life. There are things in our past that yeah, I don't understand. The things in your past you don't understand. But you're here today, moving forward, amen? And he's got you covered. I want to finish with this old story that I've shared before. Um, I don't have every detail of it, but you'll get the gist of it. There was a retired uh, Navy Commander, I, I don't know if he's a colonel. I don't do. Does Navy have colonels? I, I, I'm not sure what. I know he was a Navy pilot. I think his name was Colonel Plum. He was a motivational speaker in the 90s. That was his name. That was his last name. And, and he was a motivational speaker, and he was getting ready to, to give an address. I don't know if he was a man of faith. I don't know. He probably was or is. I don't know much about him. I just know this story. But a guy about the same age came up to him. This Colonel Plum was, was a fighter pilot in Vietnam. He got shot down and, and, and he, he uh, was a prisoner of war for a few years. And then he's a retired um, speaker. So he was getting ready to speak and he was at the dinner table. It was a kind of a banquet style thing. And this guy comes up to him and the guy says, you're Colonel Plum, aren't you? And he goes, yes, I am. He said, and you served on the USS Kitty Hawk, and you were shot down over Vietnam. Well, yes, I was. He said, I thought that was you. And he said, well, who are you? And the guy goes, I served on the USS Kitty Hawk just before you took off from our deck. I was down below and I was the one who packed your parachute. And Colonel Plum, it says, stood up and embraced the man. He packed his parachute. I wonder how Colonel Plum felt when he, when he heard that, when he heard so, somebody else say, I packed your parachute. I made provision for you. How do you feel when Jesus might say to you, I packed your parachute? I am always packing your parachute. For whatever you fly over, I am with you, I am way ahead of you. That's the vision we need to have, that he is the Alpha and the Omega. Amen? Thank you, Lord, for knowing our days, the outcomes, our decisions, whatever they may be. Thank you. Lord, that doesn't give us free license just to do whatever, because I think you know our hearts that we want your will. But sometimes, Lord, we live in uncertainty, and, and, and sometimes we're not sure. That's okay. Thank you that you are the Alpha and the Omega. Thank you that we will seek you. Thank you that, like waiting in the doctor's waiting room, we don't lack faith just because we're uncertain about something. You see our heart. You see our heart. You see our mustard seed of faith. You, you see us like that man in the Gospels. Help me. Help me in my uncertainty. Didn't stop you from healing his son. Does, doesn't stop you from healing us and directing us. So, Lord, on this morning, we give you our lives. In fact, right now, I'm going to ask you to do something. Congregation and those of you online. I'm just going to ask you to do something here. I don't want to just play church this morning. I'm going to ask you if you just want to give your life anew to Jesus Christ, just to stand. Just to stand. Now, that's a pretty vague invitation. I'll let the Lord work in you. I just want you to stand and stop looking around who's standing. <laughs> you just want to give your life anew to Jesus. And so I want your will in 2022. And just stand. Make it a statement of faith, a statement of resolve, a statement of saying, I want to seek you in the midst of my uncertainty.
I want something different in my life. You know our hearts, Jesus? Just like you know the heart of that little one out there. You just touch him. But you know, that's a good reminder, Lord. Because we may sound like that before you. In our pain, in some of our stuff of life. We, we may probably sound like a little kid in the nursery. That's, that's great. You're not turned off by that. You know how to take care of us. You know how to shepherd us. You know how to hold us. We commit our life to you as we begin this, this new year. None of us know, Lord, what could happen, may happen. We don't want to borrow from that. We just want to go one day at a time. But Heavenly Father, we thank you that when we seek you, you add all things unto us. Thank you for that. And Jesus, we just come before you that you would do a marvelous work through us, in us, for us. In your precious name, Jesus. Amen. I stand in awe. Let's sing that together. You are beautiful beyond description. This may be something. No, this may be something you share what you're going to share. So, um, hold it up here. I probably can't share without getting emotional, you know me. But, um, last Tuesday, the women decided that we were going to, um, take cookies to our shut ins. So we made up plates and we split the plates up between Roberta Love and me, and then, uh, my mom went with me and Mary. And we had tests. And I went into the facility, and um, she's in an Alzheimer's unit. It's a lockdown. I had trouble getting in. I had to get the code and all these things. And I went into the, and they're all sitting around a table waiting for their lunch. And she's, um, she's sitting at a table, and everyone's just sitting there all quiet and holding their hands politely to Slithing and I come flitting in there like my usual self. Merry Christmas, how's everybody doing? And they're just stoned. I'm like, I just need to see Tess. And so I came up to her and I, and I went across from the table and I leaned down and I looked her straight in the face. And I said, Tess, it's us. We're, we brought you cookies from the church and the ladies are thinking of you and we just want to wish, wish you Merry Christmas. And she smiles and she's very clear thinking. And she says, I'm so happy to see you. She said, you know, I never thought my life would end like this. Would, I would have my days like this. But it's okay. And I want you to tell everyone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I want you to tell everyone that I am here. I am still here. And I am good. And I am okay. But one day, I'll just be gone. But I want you to tell them. And on Friday, she went to be with Jesus. So I'm just delivering the message. Well, I'm glad you did. But what you don't know that's been stirring in my heart, and, and I'm going to share it with everybody here, 
even those on Facebook. We're going to have a, a private grave site for Ted. And I've been asked not to share when, because it's a, it's a private family thing. Okay, I get that. And I'm just being honest with you as a congregation. I don't know if this is on Facebook, and if you want to take it off of Facebook right now, go, go ahead. I don't really care. We've had three people of our church, three people, Jerry Rockema, Dick Nevin, and now Tess, and all of their family weren't really connected. Could we, could we keep the noise out of the narthex? Yeah, or close the doors or something. Thank you. Um, we've had three people whose families weren't really connected in this church, and we've never had an opportunity as a church family to honor the resurrection and the life and that these are pioneers that have gone on before us. And I feel bad about that, and I think the Holy Spirit's been stirring in me to have a memorial service for all three of these people um, at some point this month. And I really want to do that, because I'm kind of tired of this, that our church family who has known and loved these people never get a chance to celebrate their life and to celebrate and to honor that they're with Jesus. And I'll do that, yes, in my own way, but, and to kind of share some stories. They were a part of our church family. And so I'm thinking of doing that. And I guess I want you to be with me on that, that if when we schedule it, you'll be here. I've never done this before, but I just have sensed that we have not had a chance, even if you didn't even know them. They were a part of this church for years. All three of those people were. And we had services for their, their, um, their spouses, but we've never had services for them. For whatever reason, the family had chosen not to do that. I want to do that. And so um, I'll schedule something. I don't know when, but, and I'll probably contact the families and say, I think we're going to do this. And I want you to be with it. And even if you didn't know them to be here, I, I'm thinking maybe a Sunday afternoon that we just honor them in some way uh, to say they mattered to us. And as a church family, we've never had a chance to kind of reflect on that. So I'm really glad you shared this. That's awesome. And I mean, thank you for the cookie ministry and, and, and what you did. She was a lovely lady. And we won't have a lot of time at the graveside to share about her life, but... Um, I want us to do that as a church family. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Because you gave me courage to share what's been on my heart about this. Go in God's grace.